Remember, the church is a people, it's not a building. Uh, the church is a people. And Jesus says, I will build my church, the people, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's not a building that closes and opens. It's not a clergy, a hierarchy that sits on the high seats. It's the people of God together that God calls out of the world and uh, calls them to come together, assemble together, that make up the church, but he's given, given them also a mandate and responsibility that God has called us out of the world for a purpose. We are just passing pilgrims. Uh, we, we, this world is not our home. We're passing through. And as we're passing through, as citizens of heaven, we have dual citizenship. We're citizens of this earth, but also citizens of heaven. That one there doesn't expire. Amen? The one here on earth is, it has an expiry date. Uh, but the citizens that we have in heaven is forever and it's eternal. And it was paid in full, stamped by the blood of Christ. And if you don't have Christ here with, uh, in, uh, in your life and you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, maybe today, just today, will be the day that you go home and cry out and call on the Lord to be saved so you can be part of the body of Christ to move forward for the glory of God. You know, you're worshipping somebody here on earth. Everybody's worshipping somebody. You're either worshipping self or you're going to worship the Savior. Uh, you know, the perilous times have come. We're in them. Men will be lo lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And that's what we have here today. We, we're seeing people that are loving the pleasure, sin, self, more than the things of God. And it's evident yet more and more even in churches today. And God forbid that this church, this people, would ever you know, come to the very point of their lives that they love pleasure more than uh, God's glory. Amen? All right, so we're going to go through all these. Go to Mark chapter 12 first. Let's get reminded of the two greatest commandments that God has given us. <clears throat> two greatest commandments. <clears throat> so Mark chapter number 12. We'll look at the first in the beginning, and then we'll look at the second as we come to a close looking at these four principles of our church that are very Bible-based, biblical principles that are simply laid out in the Scriptures for us. Before we go into that, let's go before the Lord and pray. So this is more of a topical subject that we're looking at. It's not necessarily looking at a passage and uh, trying to get the context and the background of each verse that we have, but some of these verses stand alone and don't need explanation. And so... Uh, and uh, don't forget, there are some things in the Bible that are uh, simply principles that we can learn from, although very specific to a people, but they're principles. The Old Testament especially was given for our learning and our understanding that we would follow after the principle, not necessarily living out some of the things that they were expected to live out, amen? But the principle always uh, remains, and the principle has always been, whether you're an Old Testament saint or a New Testament saint, that we have been called to praise, love, and glorify God. Just look at Deuteronomy and see. Uh, as a matter of fact, this passage over here, Mark chapter 12, verse 30, is called from the Old Testament. And Jesus kind of, uh, you know, reminds his hearers of this passage. Have a look at Mark chapter 12 and look at verse 30. And thou shalt, well, verse 29. <clears throat> and Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, He, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy what? Heart, soul, mind, strength. For this is the first commandment. Every fiber, every fiber of your soul and being, God wants us to love him. And now this is impossible outside of salvation. For no man could love God without the spirit of God indwelling in him and perfecting him in that love and in that uh, you know, uh, first principle. It, it has to be a work of God working in us to fulfill his great good pleasure. And to love God is supreme. And there ought to be a love and a desire there to love him with all our hearts, to grow in that, to love him. And so, so first of all, uh, we have here to seek God above all. His first and supreme. This is why Jesus said, if any man will follow him after me and hate not, uh, you know the rest, father, brother, sister, uh, wife, brethren, uh, children, wife, his own life is not worthy of me. And so uh, 
Uh, over here, Jesus is calling for a supreme adoration and love. He, and it's Jesus, by the way, because we believe Jesus is the God-man. He is the Lord of all. Amen. God has given him a name which is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And he wants us to seek him supremely. No man can serve two masters. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Notice what the psalmist said in Psalm 119. Turn your Bibles there. Many of these scriptures, you know them, but as the apostle says, it's not a burdensome for us to review them and re be reminded of them. It's necessary. And as the Hebrew writer explains, lest we let them slip. And uh, have a look at verse 2. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the what? A whole heart. Not half of your heart, part of your heart, but your whole heart. And so here we see if we want to praise, love and glorify God, we must have a heart that is for God and seeks God in every area of our life. Like David had a heart for God. That doesn't mean you're going to stumble. It doesn't mean you're going to uh, not fail in certain areas. Uh, but you get up and you keep pushing forward to that goal in wanting to praise, love and glorify God. They ought to be supreme. They ought to be number one in our lives. And of course to sing and worship God. Look at Psalm 92. Uh, sorry, Psalm uh, 29, verse 2. Psalm 29, look at verse 2. Give unto the Lord glory. Do unto his name. Worship the Lord and the beauty of his what? Holiness. And so, the Lord wants to be worshipped and glorified. And that's his due. That's, he's worthy. He's worth it. It's our responsibility that God has given us to, uh, you know, sing to him. And, 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 and the beauty of holiness speaks about that is separate from the worldly kind of, you know, uh, worship. It's separate. It's different. God is holy and desires to be worshipped in a holy fashion. Amen. And then, of course, to serve God with a pure heart. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter number 3. Over here, the apostle Paul is directing servants to obey their masters, those that they work for. But notice in what kind of attitude he calls them to do so. Look at verse 22. Ver servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as man pleases, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartedly as to who? As to the Lord, and not as unto men. And so God has called us to serve in a way that is pure and genuine, single, focused. Uh, you know, we're, not, we're serving others, but as unto the Lord. By the way, we do a better job when we do it for God's glory. When we do it for men, we, we're limited because we will do it uh, you know, to the point where we're seen or acknowledged or we're giving thanks or whatever. But we, let's just say you didn't have all these different things or people weren't watching. You know, God is always watching. God is always looking. And God, by the way, will never forget your labor of love that you do show not only him, but unto others. And so do it all for the glory of God. Do it for him. Do it for his eyes, for his heart, uh, you know, for his pleasure. And so this is how we glorify God. Now, look at the fourth one, to shine for his glory, Matthew chapter 5. If we want to praise, love, glorify God, we ought to shine for his glory. <clears throat> this is also a, a common passage within the Sermon on the Mount that you know. It's very familiar. Matthew 5, look at verse 14. He says, let your light, let, uh, sorry, ye are the lights of the world. He says, a city on a hill cannot be hid. A city on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. But on a, on a candlestick, give it light unto all that are in the house. Look at verse 16. Let your light so shine before who? Before men. Why? That they may see your what? Good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, how do you bring glory to a glorious God? You know, God's already glorious. He's already magnified. He's already, you know, but he's calling us to shine for his glory. It's not that we are making him more glorious. He is glorious. But we're actually pointing people to him so they may behold him. They, they may see him. 
And, uh, and, and, and God's given us that responsibility by the life that we live. So the supreme you know, function, if you will, of the church is to bring him glory, but there are ways that we do that. And these are the next points here that will give us those indications how we can absolutely bring God glory. And that's by proclaiming the gospel, that's by growing in grace, and that's also by serving others. And we'll look at that in a moment. But I want you to go to Psalm 15 before we do that. Have a look at Psalm 15. <clears throat> Psalm 115. Have a look. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. The true main king attributes of God, his mercy and his truth. Give God glory for that. Not unto us, but unto you. But notice verse 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither that any go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore praise the Lord. And so this is our responsibility as a church that we will you know, praise God, glorify, love God and glorify God. This is what God has called us to, not to bring us glory, but to bring him glory from this time forth and forevermore. And uh, what we see take place today, and I have to add this, is that we're seeing the enemy or the system or even now our government and leaders so-called that are trying to restrict us from doing so. They're trying to limit us. They're trying to hinder us from uh, following after God and worshipping God and glorifying God like we're supposed to. A city on a hill cannot be hid. It's there to be seen. God wants us to shine. It's the church's responsibility to, to shine. And it's for his glory that the heathen may fear before God. It's our responsibility. That God has given us that responsibility to bring glory to his name by the way we sing to him and love him and obey him and worshipping him and point, pointing people to him as we're going to see in the next point. You know, Romans 13, I'm really working on this message, but Romans 13 was given as a command to us that we will honour our government and give and pay our due, uh, you know, uh, respect to them. But Romans 13 was never given for the government to tell the church of God what to do. Never. Romans 13, there's a limited, limited, let me tell you something, authority given to the government. The government cannot impose upon the father of his home, nor can he impose on the preacher in the church. Why? Because God has given them mandates to follow, not only the government to follow. And so when the government is trying to take away the responsibility from a father and the responsibility from a pastor who are subject to the greater head, Jesus Christ, which they also should be subject to, then they're actually imposing on our liberty to serve, to love, to glorify God. And so this is our chief, number one principle as a church, to glorify God in all that we do. And so, well, what's the second one? To proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go to Philippians chapter 1. Notice this gospel-focused church in Philippi. Now, this church was already gospel-focused, but the Apostle Paul <laughs> continues to encourage them in that way. They were supporting the Apostle Paul from get-go. He actually thanks God every time he remembers them for their support in his ministry and mission. <clears throat> in their fellowship in verse 5, your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now is a gospel-focused church. But he wanted them to continue with that uh, lifestyle, and he says to them in verse seven, uh, 27, only let your conversation or your lifestyle or your, or your manner of life, only let it be as becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye what? Stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. 
And you know what hinders that is the opposition and the persecution that we get. You look at verse 28. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ not only to what? Believe on him, but also to what? Suffer for his sake. So God has called us to believe on him and to follow the Lord, but also in doing so, if we want to live out the first principle and obey him by keeping the second principle, guess what? You'll be persecuted. You'll be pursued. The Apostle Paul was put in prison at this particular time and was writing to the church at Philippi from a Roman prison. And they were concerned for him. But he specifically tells them that this has happened to me for the furtherance of the gospel. What a gospel-focused man. So no matter what takes place, as we fulfill our first duty to shine for the glory of God, let it be always for the gospel's sake. A lot of people say, we need to glorify God, glorify God, glorify God. Absolutely. In one way which we can glorify God is to be gospel-focused church. If we are not a gospel-focused church, if we're not out there uh, telling people about the Lord, and we're not out there you know, sharing Christ and doing what God has called us to do, we cease to become what God has called us to be. We're a lighthouse. And the lighthouse shines. So people can show their, you know, see their way and come in and find rest in Christ. And although the government is making it hard for the church under a, under, you know, a so-called pandemic, we still have to be shining for God's glory. You're going to force us to put the candle under a bushel? And maybe we call it bushel Bible-believing church. It can't be, can it? It's a contradiction. How can you be a Bible believer and we're a church under a bushel? And if one day that we ever go underground, our light shall still shine forth, even through those woods, bringing people in to hear the gospel. Can you imagine that? I guarantee you those days will be the most precious days of your life as a Christian. You'll understand what the early church went through. You'll understand those people in other countries that don't have the liberties that we have to go and tell someone about Jesus. To utter his name in some countries is against the law, but people still do it because there's a greater law, and that's God. And so we need to submit to the Great Commission. You know it in Matthew chapter 28. And the Great Commission has always been the Great Commission. We don't want it to be the great omission in our church. Amen. Have a look at Matthew 28. Matthew 28, let's be reminded of these truths that we know. Be refreshed for 2022, amen? I guarantee you, if you're not in this book, if you're not in this book, if you're in the news, watching the news more than you are in this book, you are finished. You are done. I mean, as a preacher, if I'm watching the news and I'm not in this book, I'm, I'm taken. As soon as I get back to this book, Everything goes back to Christian normal, normal, being normal again. I'm normal. I go watch the news. I hear people over there, this, this comment, that comment, and thinking, oh, no, am I doing something wrong? I go back to this book. So, no, I'm not doing anything wrong. It's what God has called us to do. This mandate is from the Lord. Have a look at verse 18. Verse 18, Matthew 28. Verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, his disciples, saying, All power, that word power is authority, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. In heaven and in earth. So who's, who has the ultimate authority? Okay, so when God gave the government authority, it's limited authority under the authority of Jesus Christ. They need to get their nose in the God's book to be a righteous king, governing in a righteous manner. We all, all, you know, we, we, we think that, you know, God ordained ungodly authority. No, he, from the beginning, he ordained godly kings. And he rebuked God, uh, ungodly authority. The problem today is we've had a series of ungodly authorities that we think it's normal, but it's not normal. God opposes them. Now, we need to still honor them because they're God ordained, like you do with your parents or any authority, but not on the expense of truth. In other words, you can still show, uh, you know, honor, 
but we must show honor to God more by obeying Him. And if it looks like we're not and we're being rebellious to them, then that's just the way it looks and that's persecution coming our way. And I understand the shame that may come with that. And we're going to look at that later on as we close. There is shame when you, sh when you serve Christ. There's shame. There's a shame that's going to come upon God's people when you serve and love God. When you want to worship God among the heathen. You're going to be an outcast of society. People are going to look at you in a very different way. This is how it is. This is how it's always been. But there are those people that are watching that want what you have that they don't have. And we must continue to go forth with the gospel. And he says... All power is given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That still stands. Baptizing him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. What if there's a lockdown? You can't baptize people. Well, we're going to do what Daniel did like he did the fourth time when there was a, a wicked mandate. Amen. We're going to still go and continue to do what God has called us to do. You might get a fine. Well, I don't, I don't, you can't put a price on a soul that wants to follow Jesus Christ, can you? You can't put a price. But what a beautiful thing that is to be able to baptize someone that wants to follow Jesus Christ. And look at this, verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you and I'm with you all way. With you all way, even unto the end of the world, amen, end of the age. We're not left comfortless. The Lord Jesus is with us in all that we do. He gives us boldness and courage through the Spirit of God to continue to do what he's called us to do. He's with us all way, all way. And a servant is not greater than his master. Just look at what he, they did to Jesus Christ. What do you expect? Any less? No, Jesus said no. And what do you do? Preach the truth, share the truth, serve people, love people. In a very hard era, by the way. It wasn't easy in his time. Sure wasn't easy in the apostles' time. You know what, we, 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 we've come to the point where we realise that we've been spoiled Christians. <laughs> I'm serious, brethren. We've been spoiled. I mean, what kind of persecution that we get when we hand out a gospel track and someone calls us a name or laughs or something or giggles? That's probably the, as much as it goes for some of us because we're, we're, we're spoiled. We, we, we. But the persecution that people face just for living as a Christian and telling them about Christ and lifting up Jesus Christ, not willing to, to deny Christ, is unbelievable in some places and countries and have always been a pleasure for a true Christian to bear and suffer reproach for the name of Christ. Moses said, I'd rather suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. May God help us have that heart. And then we say, not only to submit to the Great Commission under this point, but to send the light worldwide. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. By the way, that word witness is uh, the Greek word for martes. You should be martyrs. Wow. Witnesses. And no doubt the apostles were. You should be witness first where in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and, all, and unto the uttermost part of the world. And we know that God's grace was upon them and they did that which God called them to do. You see the first uh, you know, movement in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And then we see the uttermost part using the Apostle Paul on his first, second, and third missionary journey. And look at 2000, about 2,000 years later, we are byproducts of the Great Commission because it was being sent out. Now, we're hoping that those church plants in different places and that in the Solomon Islands are doing what God has called them to do, that they may reach their ears. It's going to be so difficult for us to even go across the sea with what's taking place today. But may God help us to stay true with what has been taking place. You say, what do you mean? Well, there are certain churches that have been started. There are people that have started churches in different places and churches established. They just need to strengthen the things that they've remained and continue to reach their area. Many churches are dying for the lack of sharing the gospel in their Jerusalem. Many. We have forgotten. The mandate has been lost. We're not thinking about the, the Great Commission anymore. 
I'll tell you why, because people are thinking about other things. Christians are thinking about self more than they are the things of God. And look at this, to share the gospel to all people. Every, look, we should be a people that no matter who we meet, when we meet them, be ready. That if, even if we're working and we're on the run and on the go and filling up petrol, to stop a gospel pamphlet. A gospel pamphlet goes a long way, my friends. Just a long way. Someone that we meet, a friend that we know, family member that we've never told them before about Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? That we need to think about people that we can reach and tell them about our testimony and what God has done in our life and what God wants to do in their life, especially in these last days. We ought to always be focused on sharing Christ with people. This is, ought to be the heart of the church. And have a look at Mark 5. This testimony in Mark 5 is an absolute blessing unto me. A man was demon-possessed. Jesus heals him. And now we have the demon-possessed man want to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, no. This is what I want you to do. You say, what did he want him to do? Have a look in verse uh, 18. Look at this. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been demon-possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. He wanted to go with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home and to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. Look at this, verse 20. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did what? Marvel. Not only just his friends, but all those in Decapolis. You know, soon enough, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. If you are so sensitive in sharing the gospel, over the years, over the years, people will know. There's that person that bears the name of Christ on their lips, on their heart, everywhere they go. There's that person. You'll be known. You'll be known in your community. You'll be known among your family members. And there'll a lot of be people that separate from you because they can't handle the light that is in you, that you shine for God's glory, but that's okay. But there are others that will always sink, always sink about the things that you tell them, especially when you sow the seed in their heart faithfully. Because the word of God never returns void. Yeah. Never. I don't know if it was a year ago, or two years ago, I met one of these ladies uh, last night on the street. She was sitting and she was finished. Absolutely finished. Was drinking. And I would say that it would be more than drinking because she was doing silly things and um, things that were not, were not normal. She needs the Lord. I've witnessed to her before. I didn't recognize her until she said, you know, my name. And she reminded me how I witnessed to her. I couldn't remember. I mean, you meet so many people. Her, her, her friend told her he meets that many people. He probably just, just don't take it personal. Don't get offended. People know, even when she was finished, she was, she was finished. She was just intoxicated and she still remembered. I couldn't believe it. Because the word of God never returns void. Yeah. The word of God is good and this is what people need. Even in her state, she still is thinking about the things perhaps that she heard. Because the word of God, the gospel, is powerful. That's why the Apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed. Why? Because it is the power of God and the salvation to anyone that believes. Yeah. Have a look at 2 Corinthians 5. Look at verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become what? New. New. Okay, so if any man, doesn't matter who you are, Paul the Apostle, or not Paul the Apostle. Any man being Christ, he's a new creature. Look at this. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us, plural, the ministry of what? Reconciliation. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Given us the ministry of reconciliation. That's all we are. We're just one beggar, someone said, telling another beggar where to find bread. And Jesus is the bread of life. Is it hard to tell people about Christ? Is it hard to testify? Well, it is perhaps if, you, if you're not used to it 
And it is, if you've forgotten your testimony in Christ, you need a testimony to testify. And by the way, you will tell people about the love of your life when you fall in love with him. That's why Jesus said to the church of Ephesus, do your first works. All the things that you're doing in church and exposing error and pointing out false doctrine and so forth, that's good. But hey, listen, don't forget your first love. People normally boast about the things that they love. You're going to tell them about how great things God has done for you. You believe God has done great things for you, given your life, given you good things. And after like a sheep gone astray, turned to your own way, God comes in the form of a man as a good shepherd to seek after the sheep that would call you to repentance, turn back to God. All like sheep gone astray, all have turned to his own way, but God has laid upon him, upon Christ, the iniquity of us all. He'd come to die for us. Upon that cross, listen, we have nothing to proclaim if we haven't received it ourselves. We have nothing to, we have nothing to tell. We're just driving back. We're dropping the brothers off and coming home. And said, listen, brother, if we can't go out and tell people about Jesus, life is not worth living. We don't have much to say. <laughs> we don't have much stories to tell. This is an old, old story. But it's fresh in you every time you tell it to somebody that's never heard it. And it does something to their soul. Something to their soul. It did, it did to me. It did to me. It was music to my ears. It was a save unto life. And you know, I understand that many times that you preach the gospel to people, it's a save unto death. But you know what? I'm not going to let that squash the goodness of God in my life and telling others about him. No way in the world. No way in the world they can go and mock my Savior, they can laugh at him, they can kind of do all that they want, but I'm still going to tell the next man about the goodness of God. Church, we need to be that people that always gossip the gospel. Amen? And by the way, if you always gossip the gospel, you have no part in gossiping about something that doesn't matter. And meddling in other person's businesses. People are too busy just tearing each other apart and doing the very thing that God has called them to do. Amen? That's what happens. That's what we see here today. That's what's taking place today. May God help us be a church. Listen, striving together, one mind, one spirit for the faith of the gospel. And then we see here the third one, to prepare to grow in grace. Have a look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 3. Preparing to grow in grace. By the way, these are not necessarily in order. All these things need to be focused on one and the same. Amen. Growing in grace, telling people, serving others, praising God. All right, have a look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 18. Look at verse 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, uh, uh, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. As Christians, we need to grow. And that means we need to saturate ourselves in the word of God. Jesus said, no man lives by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How often do you eat? How often? Some of us three times a day and nibblies in the middle of those sessions. By the way, is the word of God any different? That you set some time throughout the day and you feast on the Word of God and throughout the day, whether you're working or throughout the day, whether you're just doing something that is outside of what you should uh, or normally be doing, you're just thinking about Scripture, you're meditating about Scripture, you're thinking about this, thinking about that regarding the Word of God. It's wonderful. God wants us to saturate ourselves with His Word. Thinking and meditating, mulling over the things that we've learnt in the morning, perhaps the things that we, uh, you know, being brought to our attention, just thinking on these things. Build us up in the faith. And this is the next one. God wants us to be stable, mature believers. God doesn't want us to be tossed to and fro with every woman of doctrine, changing things all the time, following after this, 
doctrine, that doctrine, watching that debate, this debate, this. Brethren, we need to be built up in the faith and get on with the very things that God has called us to do. God wants to build us up so we could be conformed into the image of our dear Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to see uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know this passage is common. Have a look at verse uh, 16. He says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That's divine teaching, for reproof, for correction. For instruction in righteousness, why? For what purpose? The man of God may be perfect or mature, complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Brethren, God wants us more, uh, uh, wants us more and more to grow by the word of God. He just doesn't want us to grow in theology. He wants us to work out what we are learning I, you know, I love theology. It tells us about God's character. And I love theology. It tells us about eternal salvation and truths and things that pertain to the Godhead. I love that. But if those things are not changing our lives and we're not growing them, then just, just knowledge. If we can actually answer people uh, you know, and, 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 you know, in, a, in a way that is theological, uh, and, uh, you know, true, and all, you know, we, we become, uh, how can I say... Um, apologetics, that's not enough. We need the Word of God to work in us. Effectually, effectually, working in us. Working the Word in us that we may grow in the Him. And this is why we need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There ought to be, you know, if we don't apply what we learn, then we'll be deformed in our Christian life. God just doesn't want us to have big heads. He wants us to have big hearts. Amen. Or we will be deformed Christians. I want you to see, I, I miss this, but look at the psalmist's heart, 119. But uh, Psalm 119 and verse 28. He says, My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according to thy word. Remove far from me the way of lying, and grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I hid before me. I have stuck unto thy testimonies. O Lord, put me not to shame. I will run in the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my what? My heart. Now I want you to see not only to saturate ourselves and to be stable Christians and believers, but have a look that we would surrender our lives to the will of God. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. We want to grow in grace. We want to grow to know what God's will is and that we may continue to do that which pleases the Lord. Have a look at verse, 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that su hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from what? sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the what? Will of God. And so we, we've been saved, brethren, to grow to know the will of God that we may fulfill it, especially in those hard times, that we might find ourselves like our Lord Jesus Christ, in a sense, in the garden, saying, not my will, but thine be done. The will of God is not necessarily easy to go after because it's, it, 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 there's a conflict with our interest, with what we want to do, with what God wants to do in us and through us. Jesus was struggling in the flesh because he foresaw, I believe, the sufferings that will take place, if it be possible. I mean, come on, I mean, what Jesus went through Humanly speaking, and what he foresaw, it's not easy. And God is not calling us to go and suffer the way he did on the cross. But we will suffer because it conflicts with what we want to do. And, we, and, and, and if we identify ourselves with Christ doing his will, it brings shame and reproach. The world doesn't know us because we know him, because it knew him not. It's, it's what we identify with Christ. We don't identify with the world. That's what takes place. 
We want to do God's will versus what the system and what the world expects us to do. We, 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 there it is. That's why the Apostle Paul said, God forbid that I, should, that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom I am crucified under the world, and the world is crucified under me. You know what? I'm dead to the world, and the world is dead to me. Why? Because he's doing the will of God. We want to grow to know the will of God that you and I may fulfill it as a church. And in these times, especially, Lord, what will thou have us to do? Give us wisdom and grace to know how to glorify you in these tough times that we've never, ever been in. Never. And I believe God will show us if we're seeking after him with our whole hearts. If we have a desire to know his will, he will show us his will. God reveals it to us very clearly in his word. And then to sustain an intimate walk with God. This is so important. Have a look at a John 15. You know, God has saved us that we may walk with him, walk with Christ. I don't understand. And I, 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 Christians, I, I'm, I'm, not mean, I'm not trying to say this to be mean to anybody. But I do not understand those that profess Christ as their saviour and don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't understand that. Because Christianity is not a system of religion. It is, it is not a denomination. Christianity is found in a person and that person is in Jesus Christ. And uh, have a look at verse 4. Look at what Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth what? Much fruit. For without me you can do what? Nothing. Zero. And that's having an in intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen, when we get saved, God puts us in a relationship with him because of Christ. We, we draw closer to him, not further away from him. And I understand the, co the concept of backsliding and all the rest of that. But listen, you're either going to be chasing back in the fold or God's just going to take you home. One way or another, we're going to bear fruit. We should be bearing fruit. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth everyone whom he receiveth. You know, when you, rem when you remember the four soils, there was one that bared fruit. The other three didn't bear any fruit. One looked like it was bearing fruit, but it didn't. It endured for a while, fell away. The true Christian bears fruit. And it's, and it's because of the sustained, we, 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 we must sustain, have a sustained relationship with Jesus Christ. We, again, I'm going to say it again. We ought to not forget our first love or leave our first love. Our relationship with Jesus Christ must be preeminent. Our love for him must be first. Our uh, dialogue must be always there, listening, hearing from God. It's important. It's the whole purpose of growing in grace. Without Christ, we can bear no fruit. Have a look at verse 14. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I what? There you go. You know why Abraham was called a friend of God? Because he obeyed God. He did the very thing that God called him to do. Abraham, get thee out. He went out. Abraham, take Isaac. He took Isaac. Staggered not at the promises of God. Christian, God tells us to do things very specifically in his word. Do them. Do them with your whole heart. So, you know, uh, when we look at a command, it should never be, oh, this is a command of God, you know, this is a burden. No, it should be a pleasure. And it's a pleasure when, listen to me very carefully, when you take each command as an opportunity to love God back. If you love me, keep my what? Okay, Lord, I'm going I'm to do this because I just want to love you. You know, Lord, you told me love my wife as you loved me, so I want, to love, I want to love you and loving my wife. And you know what? When I do that, I can see the benefits and the fruits of his commands. When God gives you commands, it's for your well-being. <laughs> it's not to hurt you. And thank God for his commands. 
without his commands, I mean, he, he doesn't only make a, a relationship, you know, you know, uh, just stay together, he makes it flourish. When you apply the principles and obey God, man, there's blessings. There's blessings in keeping God's word. God will bless you. You just read Psalm 115 when you can and you see there's blessings. When we fear God and keep his word, there's blessings. He says, if you, you are my friends. I call you friends and not servants. For a servant knoweth not his ma- what his master doeth. But a friend does. You know, God revealed to Abraham what he was going to do with Sodom and Gomorrah because he was his friend. Didn't have to, but he did. And they had a dialogue. Imagine that, talking with God. I mean, I think that's the best part of Christianity. That we get to speak to God. We grow in our relationship with him. We've drawn so close that it will be so hard to be coming apart. The, 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 the verge of backsliding would never be there. You see Christians today and they're just always kind of backsliding, backsliding, backsliding. Sometimes I wonder, are you backsliding or you need to get right with God and get saved? I don't know. But over here my Bible says that we, we bear fruit. And not only fruit, just so we can be blessed, but it, fruit that brings glory to God. Look at verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall, be, so shall ye be my disciples. By the way, brethren, that's what a disciple is. He bears fruit for God's glory by keeping his word. That's what we are made to be as Christians. A bird sings. That's what it was made to do, amen? It sings to the glory of God. Well, we as Christians, disciples, are made to follow him and continue in his word and be disciples indeed and bear fruit which remains. And this is what God wants us to do. And then, of course, to be spirit-filled Christians. Ephesians 5.18. What do you mean, spirit-filled? Is being spirit-filled is... Is like of what we hear today, people falling on the ground and shaking uncontrollably or being un, being you know unsober and no 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 that's not being spirit filled. As a matter of fact, when you're spirit filled, you're sober. Um, The Bible says here in Ephesians five, verse eighteen, be not drunk with wine where uh, wherewith is excess, but be what filled with the Spirit. You know, this is, a, this, this is actually a disposition that God wants us to have. Say, be spirit-filled. I want you to be controlled or influenced by the Spirit of God. Walk in the Spirit that you may not fulfill the lust of the flesh. God wants us to be guided or led by the Spirit. In Romans, he talks about that. The children of God are led by the Spirit of God. And we follow the Spirit of God as he points us to the Word of God. And we obey and we walk And we walk and we grieve not the Spirit of God. How do we grieve the Spirit? Is when we sin. And we need to get that right and confess it. And quench not the Spirit of God. When God tells us to do something and we delay, we're quenching the fiery work in our hearts. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. The Spirit of God is in us. It's working in us. And we can quench it or grieve it. It's that work in us. Being Spirit-filled here is having God continue to work in us, allowing God to work in us. We don't grieve him or quench him. He who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And by the way, Philippians 1.6 talks uh, about the work of grace done in their life that, you know, that the Apostle Paul talks about to the church. I mean, you look at the church at Philippi and you see a great work done in their life. I mean, if you wanted to pattern your church after, you look at the church at Philippi and say, yep. Church at Corinth? Mm-mm. Why? Because the church at Corinth, for the most part, were carnal. Prided themselves with wisdom and gifts and spiritual gifts and so forth, rather than being mature to live out what God is actually doing in their, in their lives. And we want to be matured Christians, amen? Sober-minded Christians. I think the greatest, I believe the greatest work that God wants to do on this side of heaven is to conform every single one of us into the image of Christ. It's not about how many 
gifts that God has given you or the measure of faith in which God is... By, by the way, that's God's responsibility. Our responsibility is to fulfill the very things that He's called us to do by His grace. And that's to be Spirit-led. If we are not Spirit-led, then we are not going to fill the very, fulfill the very things that God has called us to do. A lot of people say, what is my gift? What is my calling? Well, walk in the Spirit, do the very things, take the baby steps of what God is doing in your life now, and over the years you look back and see how God has been using you and where God is leading you. There's no gift test, by the way, amen? You don't take a test to see what, you, all that, I've taken that before, and, and um, I think I'm not, I'm not going to take another one. I'm just going to walk in the Spirit, I'm going to obey God. And then I look back and I think, praise, you, praise God for what he's done and what he's doing and what I anticipate for him to do because I know he wants to do more. And he does, brethren. We need to grow. Have a look at second, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. And in this passage, we see something that stunts our growth. <coughs> First Peter chapter number 2, look at verse 1. We're coming to a close. We're almost there. 1 Peter chapter number 2, look at verse 1. He says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, guile, hypocrisies, and envies, and evil speakings, all of those, every kind, every form, lay them aside. Just lay them aside. These are some of the things, by the way, that can suppress our appetite for the Word of God. Grieves the Spirit of God. We wonder sometimes why we're reading the Word of God like a chore. And we just want it to be done with you know we, we, I guarantee you if you don't have a hypocrisy or wickedness in your life and you're under the word of God you know you, you can have a room full of people and noise and you're just you just can't even hear what's taking place because the word of God has gripped you to the very point that is working in your life and you're in awe of it you're you're you're, you're you know you're feasting you're drinking and uh and you, you don't even know what's taking place with, with, with what's going on because you're just so still the word of God has captivated you and uh, it says desire the sincere milk as newborn babes next verse desire the sincere milk of the word why for what purpose that ye may what grow thereby every year when we've had a baby almost every year when that baby is born I just get convicted more and more. You say, why? Because that baby cries and cries and cries and cries until it gets the milk. And I think to myself, am I like that baby? <laughs> am I like that baby? Because this is what the Bible's saying. As a newborn babe, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow. Now, this is the thing. This is not only sin suppresses our appetite for the Word of God, but even the next one here, the forgetting the grace of God in our life. Look at, if, look at, look at verse 3. If so be you have tasted that the Lord is what? Gracious. Forgetting about the goodness of God in your life and how good God is to you and how much He loves you can also, I believe, personally suppress an appetite for the Word of God. Have you tasted of God and His Word and how good He is and gracious and merciful, His justice and judgments. The psalmist says, I wake up and, 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 and praise Him for His justice and judgment, His goodness, His love and His mercy. When you forget about those things, you're not going to have an appetite for the Word of God. And so we need to grow in grace. We need to grow in grace. Number four, and last, the fourth principle of our church is to passionately and gladly love and serve others. Go back to uh, Mark chapter 12, please, and look at verse 31. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these. By the way, the whole ten of God's moral law hang on these two. The first part has to do with God, the second part has to do with our neighbor. If we would focus on loving God with all our hearts and doing the very things that pleases Him, 
and our neighbour as we would love ourselves and treat them as we would like to be treated. And I believe that we'll become a church pleasing to God. You know, Jesus said that they will know you, they will know you to be his disciples when you what? When you love one another. In other words, and this is another message I'd like to bring, it's visible, they'll see it. Like that city on a hill that cannot be hid and that the sinners out there will see. The very way they come in and we love one another. And we're not having groups and cliques and this and that. We're one and united and we care for one another. And we're not talking behind each other's back. We're not bickering and gossiping and slandering and all the rest of it. And tearing the body apart. But rather coming together. It's very important. First one, sacrificing for each other. Look at Ephesians 5. Be ye, therefore. Be ye. Every time you see be, it means something that God wants us to be. Amen? Uh, God says, I am holy. He's not being holy. He is holy. That's his essence. It's who he is. He's not being. We are being. We are growing into the very thing that God wants us to grow into. We grow in love. We grow in holiness. But over here, he says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a what? Sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savour. Imitators of God. As Christ walked, we walk. And we know the way he walked and the way he lived, he was no doubt sacrificing. Not only there on the cross, but even the way he lived here on earth. He sacrificed. He lived for others. He cared for others, his disciples. And the way he even treated his disciples, exceptional, cared for them. The way he interacted with them, and helped them, remarkable, exceptional. What a leader, what a servant, what an example of true leadership. I mean, it, it, I guarantee you, if Peter was amongst us, would probably say, Peter, forget about you, finished, done, over. No, the Lord was patient with Peter. You know, there are people that have a heart for God and they're just growing and growing and growing and growing. And sometimes those things you see and you see, one, God is refining them and he will use them and so forth. All you've got to see is you've got to see a heart for God. In their life, there are people that have hearts for God. We need to nurture that. Your children have a heart for God, nurture them. By the way, if we were to love one another as, as Christ loved, loved us, if we look at Ephesians 4 and the ending of that chapter, we see some examples that he gives to us. He says in verse 30, uh, verse 29, let no corrupt uh, communication, Ephesians 4 verse 21, let no corrupt communication proceeds out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of what? Edifying, building up, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Spirit of God whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Look at this, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, kind, not cruel, kind, uh, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know what's happening today in, in, in families and churches, the forgiveness and true restoration doesn't exist hardly. You know why marriages suffer? Because they give up on each other so easily. One's ready to repent and ask for forgiveness and the other one, their nose are in the air. I forgive you, but it's never going to be the same. There's no restoration. There's no true, uh, you know, Love, sacrifice of laying one's life. Only words on the altar. Only wo words on the altar. I mean, God help us, every single one of us, to love by sacrificing for each other. Second of all, to serve one another. Have a look at Galatians 5. For brethren, ye have been caught under liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye do not consume one another. 
And that happens because if you keep on reading, you're walking in the flesh and not in the Spirit of God. For the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Have a look at uh, chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. We looked at this at New Year's Eve. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we what? If we faint not. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of what? Faith. And sometimes we have a heart to go and seek sinners. And I've said this over the years. We go seek sinners. We love on sinners. We, we want to see them saved. But somehow when they walk through the doors and become saints of God, things change. No, it's not to change. It's like a marriage. The man gets the woman, he does all that he can to woo her, he wins her, I love you, and then all of a sudden, the honeymoon ends. What happened? Selfish nature. We'll go win people, we love the, the sinners, we, they come in the, the body of Christ and they become saints, and we still ought to love them, especially the household, even more, the household of, uh, of faith. Amen? And that's why the Bible time and time again, I don't have time to labor this, it says forbearing one another. That's not just putting up with one another. We can put up with a lot of things, but forbearing means that you're willing to work with. And you leave, listen, you give room for people to grow. Especially those people that come in and they're saved at a young age and they have no Christian heritage. I mean, no Christian heritage. They don't know the Bible and they have a lot of, you know, different habits and different things but man i tell you once they see the bible they're like whoa i didn't know this and they start developing and they grow and they and it's beautiful and so you need people you need to give people room to grow and uh and flourish and and and, and so forth is serving them loving them and then of course last but not least to strive to keep the unity have a look at ephesians 4 one to three. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Don't you just love that? I'm a prisoner of the Lord. <laughs> yeah. What does he mean by that? He said, I'm arrested. The Lord, his love, I am absolutely arrested. The love of Christ constrains me. I'm under arrest. I'm his prisoner. Yeah. <laughs> what a blessing. If we really just understand what that means alone. I'm his prisoner. I am bound, he is my master, I go where he tells me, and I do what he says, and uh, I preach what, he's, what he calls me to preach, and, um, and look what he says, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein, wherewith you are called, I beseech you, see the apostle Paul is not just telling them, he's beseeching them, there's an urgency there, all right? With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. See, the Spirit of God leads us in true unity and in love, never on the expense of truth, because charity doesn't rejoice in evil, but rejoices in what? Truth. And so this unity ought to be fought for, endeavouring to keep. The Spirit of God is the one that leads us in unity. But many a times, Christians are quenching the Spirit of God. And that's why there's no unity in the church. May God help us to fight. You know, to have that spirit of Abraham when there was a, you know... Uh, 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 a contention or a division between Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen. You remember that? There was a contention over some property. You know how Abraham dealt with it? Hey, Lot, pick, pick, pick which side you want. If you take that side, I'll just take that side. If you take that side, I'll take that side. Just, hey, we're brethren. And there are some things that we just, it's not worth fighting over. I mean, churches, Christians, just babies, get over it and get on with it. 
And there are other things, if people can't find something, they'll create something just so they can always have contention and division. May God help us never to be that church. But rather pick our fights and make sure we fight for the cause of Christ, for the word of God, for the word of life, fighting the good fight. When we do that, we do it well, we do it according to God's word. There's never an ungodly division. Somewhere along the way, we have veered off from the word of God when we have a carnal division. You agree with that? When we can't part ways in peace, there's something wrong. True? There's something wrong. And I've said it just recently, those that create carnal division are usually the ones causing for false unity. We don't want false unity. We want true unity. And the true unity is endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit, capital S. Not have the Spirit of unity. False unity. That, that's what the world is trying to do, by the way. Not only the world, but the world of religions. Trying us to bring us together with this false unity and this false peace. And that's what the Antichrist is trying to do. May, may God help us have this, the, the spirit of God that leads us into true unity. These are the four, by the way, that means we don't compromise. And uh, these are the four principles. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 to 8 sums it up and we're done. I know this has probably gone just a little bit over than what we normally have, but... I think it's important to start off 2022, amen? Just to be refreshed with these important principles from God's Word. Philippians chapter 2, look at this. Look at the heart of the Apostle Paul, verse 1. If there be any, if there, sorry, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than himself. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Look at this. Look at this example. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. You know what this tells us? That Jesus was willing to lower himself. And he did. And he took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He lowered himself. And he, being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Look at this. Even the death of the cross. You know what we see in this passage? True servanthood. True sacrifice. True submission. All in Christ. God called him to do a specific work and he finished it. He finished it. What an example that we have before us. Amen? We are all told to look to Christ. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, Follow me as I follow Christ. As I follow Christ, you follow Christ. The Hebrew writer says to lay aside every weight and every sin that which so easily besets us. That we would run the race with patience. Look at this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You see what Jesus went through. May God help every single one of us in this church. Keep our eyes on Christ. Never be stubborn. To shrug, if you will, like the Old Testament rebellious saints. They shrugged their shoulders and they would not hear. They made their heart adamant as a stone. When the preacher preached or when the word of God was brought forth, they almost went like this. If we ever get to that place, we are gone. May God help us to always be sensitive to the word of God in this church. 
and never veer away from opening up the Bible and seeing what does the Bible say and all manner of faith and practice and having, you know, the forbearing attitude and spirit and patience with one another. Loving God supremely and loving each other. Amen? Let's pray.